Hello and welcome back to Biology. My name is Mr. Kabuski. Uh, we're going to be moving on to Unit 11 today. We're going to be talking about energy. Uh, we're really going to kind of move quickly through this unit because we're getting to the end of the year. Uh, we're really only going to spend time talking about two big processes, photosynthesis and something called cellular respiration, which we'll talk about uh, next class. Uh, but today let's just focus on photosynthesis. You should know it by now. You probably learned it back in middle school. You know, it's the process that plants do uh, and to take water, carbon dioxide, and energy from sunlight and convert it to sugars and oxygen. Okay, it's important that you understand that the plants don't necessarily eat this way. So uh, when people say things like that, but it's the process that they use to create sugar, uh, which is really important. So basically, what happens is we take sugar, or excuse me, we take sunlight and these two gases and we can combine them into a, a sugar a substance that we can use as plants, animals, everybody uh, as an energy source which we'll learn more about when we talk about cellular respiration. But the correct chemical formula for photosynthesis is 6CO2 plus 6H2O results in C6H12O6 which is glucose plus 6O2. So in other words these two are the products these two are the the uh, reactants to the requirements of the of the, pho of the pho of photosynthesis. It takes place in the chloroplast of cells. Hopefully, you remember that organelle back from the beginning of the year. There are three parts of the chloroplast you need to know. Uh, there is the thylakoid, which is the they look like little coins inside the chloroplast. These are the site of photosynthesis. You need to know the stroma. It's the fluid space inside here. So it's the fluid that makes up that empty space inside the chloroplast. Like picture a gusher. When you squeeze a gusher, that juice that comes out, that would be the stroma here. And then granum. Uh, they are the stacks of thylakoids. Okay, that's what, the, that's what they're known as. Okay. Now, photosynthesis, the first stage of it takes place right here of the membrane of a thylakoid, and that's what we're going to be focusing in on, okay? Now, if I zoomed in on there, and we will a little bit later, I would see lots of little green blobs. These green blobs are known as pigment. They're actually a very specific name, uh, type of pigment. But a pigment is any light-absorbing substance, okay? Uh, in case you're not aware of this, color is actually just the appearance of uh, how our brain takes in wavelengths of light. So we receive wavelengths of light into our eyes and whatever the wavelength is, meaning how big it is and how fast it is, that's how we determine what color light it is. And that's all that color really is. Uh, plants contain three types of pigment. They have two types of chlorophyll, chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. Uh, chlorophyll is what gives plants their green color. So they are green in color because they reflect green light, which means they absorb other uh, types of light. So like blues, indigos, reds, and oranges. And then there's the carotenoids. These are what we see in the fall because when chlorophyll dies when in cold weather, the carotenoids can survive a little bit longer, which means plants can make sugars just a little bit longer and help them stave off uh, the cold, cold winter days coming up. Okay, So these are our three types of pigments. Now, and just as a quick refresher, you don't need to necessarily put this in your notes, but it's a great physics lesson. Okay, uh, We said that light is just wavelengths, okay? And it's also something called photons, which we'll talk more about here in a second. But so each color has its own wavelength, meaning the distance between wave to wave, okay? And its frequency, meaning how fast the waves uh, come. So red is the biggest and the slowest, violet is the smallest and the fastest. When I combine, if I pushed all three of these together and combine them together, that would be white light. White light contains all of these different wavelengths. This is also where we get our Roy G. Biv from because it goes in this order, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And that's why they seem to transfer into one another when you look at a rainbow because you're seeing the wavelength slow down and get or excuse me, speed up and get uh, smaller. Quick review of that topic. Okay, if we illuminated with white light, which is Roy G. Biv, meaning it contains all colors, and this paper was capable of absorbing Roy Biv, what color would this paper appear as? Well, it would appear as green because it's reflecting the green. That's why it doesn't absorb it. Okay, over here, uh, we uh, excuse me, we're illuminated with white light and we absorb Oy G. Biv, which means where there's no R, the R is being reflected, so this would be red paper. Here's a couple other examples. Go ahead and practice them if you like. There's our violet paper, and here is our yellow paper. Okay, now here's two tricky ones. Okay, the first example over here, illuminated with white and absorbs Roy G. Biv. That means no light is being reflected, so this paper would be black. And over here, illuminated with white light and absorbs nothing, this paper would be white. All right, now, quick question for you. Here are our three types of pigment, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, chlorophyll, or excuse me, and carotenoids. Each one of them, uh, we said, absorbs 
different wavelengths of light, okay? So here's chlorophyll A, it's the dark green line. What color and what wavelength of light does it absorb best? Well, if I go to its peak, which is right here, and I go straight down, okay, it's somewhere between 400 and 500. I'd say this is probably like 425, 430-ish, and it's like an indigo, because here's violet, so this would be indigo. So chlorophyll A absorbs indigo best, but it still absorbs all blues, all purples, all indigos, and then most reds, oranges, and yellows. Chlorophyll B absorbs light blue the best, somewhere in the 480 range, okay? But it also uh, doesn't absorb violet as well, but it does absorb the blues uh, almost into the greens a little bit and then a little bit more in the oranges. So this is where the advantage is. Having the different pigments is an advantage because we can absorb more in different types of light, meaning that we can absorb more energy and thus do photosynthesis more often. So. Speaking of photosynthesis, there are two reactions that take place. The first is known as the light reaction because it requires sunlight. It requires sunlight and water, takes place in the thylakoid, and gives off oxygen as a byproduct. It also creates what we call charged electron carriers, ATP and NADPH, which those then will be what power the next reaction, which is the dark reaction. It also requires carbon dioxide to do the reaction. It takes place in the stroma, which was the liquid, and it results in sugar, uh, which is the whole ball game. It's the whole reason we're doing photosynthesis is to make sugar. Now, the uncharged electron carriers were the charged ones. We used up their energy, so now they'll be recycled back to the light reaction to become charged again. Speaking of the light reaction, let's take a look at the light reaction, how it actually works. Remember, it takes place on this little piece of thylakoid right on the membrane here. Okay, So it's taking place on all these membranes, but let's zoom in on this one section and see what we see. Okay. On the above here, we have the stroma. Below, we have the thylakoid. And this green blob, that's our pigment. Now, each pigment contains billions of free electrons, okay? These free electrons, when they're hit by light, light, we said, contains wavelengths and particles. Those particles are called photons. These photons, when they hit these electrons, get them all excited, okay? And they start moving across this membrane. The first place they get to is this transport protein. And this transport protein is actually a pump. It's going to pump hydrogen across the membrane. So this is a type of active transport, way back to semester one there, okay? But our electron now has used up all of his energy, so he needs to get excited again. So we have another pigment that's hit by another sunbeam. Another photon excites the electron, and it moves to this electron carrier. Now, the reason we call this the electron carrier is because it's going to hold the electron so that we can combine the free electron with NADP plus and hydrogen and when we combine the three, we get something called NADPH. Now, NADPH is important because it's going to carry that electron full of energy off to the dark reaction, or in this case, the dark side. Okay, so we need more hydrogens, okay? We need more hydrogens, and we need more electrons. We use them all up. That's where water comes in. Water, really, the only reason we need it is to make H pluses, and free up some electrons. So we get rid of that oxygen, it's given off as a gas, as a byproduct, the same way we give off carbon dioxide. So the free electrons will move into the pigment to be used again, and now we have an excess of hydrogens on the bottom of the screen. Well, what happens when we have too many hydrogens in one area, or too many of anything in one area, and not enough in the other? They want to move with the gradient. Okay, They want to go from high concentration to low. This is passive transport. Again, thank you very much, semester one. When this happens, we hold on, we use that energy that from the movement of the hydrogen to take ADP and a free phosphate and combine them together to make ATP, which is our second energy carrier that's going to go to the dark side. The dark reaction is known as the Calvin cycle. This is a pretty good representation of how it works. For this class, for right now, because we're having to shorten things, the most important thing to me is that you understand that we need carbon dioxide. Okay, We use up that ATP and the NADPH. Okay, and the whole point of using those up is to make glucose. Okay, that's the whole point, is to make glucose. Here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to take a piece of paper and I want you to fold it like you're putting it into an envelope. Okay, unfold it and across the top, just like you were going to write a letter, I want you to write real big across the top the word photosynthesis. And then beneath it, I want you to write photosynthesis. I want you to write its requirements and its products. Go ahead and write them over here to the right. Once you have that done, go to the middle section. In the middle, I want you to draw this picture. This is the best representation of photosynthesis that I can think of, okay? What you're going to do, and let me explain it real quick. On the left side, we have the light reactions. They take place in the thylakoid. That's why we have the thylakoid drawn behind here, okay? It requires light and water. They go in, and what comes out is oxygen, which is given off as a byproduct. 
Okay, and then ATP and NADPH go on to the dark reaction. The dark reaction requires carbon dioxide, so that's brought in. It takes place in the stroma. That's why I don't have anything drawn behind it. Okay, and it makes glucose. The NADP plus and ADP, since they get used up, go back to the light reaction to be recycled. Please also put the chemical formula. You can put this one or the one that includes the 6CO2, 6HUO, and so on. Okay? Finally, I want you to put that description that I just rattled off to you at the bottom of your paper, as well as naming the organelle that this takes place in, which is the chloroplast. Okay, so quick review. What is photosynthesis? It's the process that plants go through to take sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide and make glucose and give off oxygen. What role do pigments play? They are light absorbing, so they absorb energy to excite electrons. And what is the process of photosynthesis? We have the light reaction, which requires light, energy, and water. Okay, it gives off oxygen, it makes NADPH and ATP excited and will have full, be full of energy, which go on to then the dark reaction, which is step two, which also needs carbon dioxide, and that process creates glucose. I know it's a lot to take in, and it seems a little complicated. Trust me, it could be a lot more complicated than we just went over. If you have questions, don't hesitate to contact me, jkoboski at gocathedral.com, or visit the website, mrkoboski.wordpress.com, and follow me on Twitter, at Coach Kibuski. Hope you have a great day, and take care.